Good morning. Good morning. Certainly like to welcome each of you here to our services at First Baptist Church. If you're joining us from home, we welcome you as well. As we gather in this place today, we gather as brothers and sisters in Christ. And as we come to stay with the intent to set aside all those things, we come as one body, one church, one fellowship. And worship, we come this day to worship our Lord and Savior. So let us now prepare our hearts as Sue leads us in our morning prelude. Here I am to worship.
I invite you now to open your worship guide as we read our unison call to worship taken from Psalms 121. Please open your worship guide and read with me in our call to worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Sisters and brothers, let us worship God. Pray with me now. Oh Lord God and Heavenly Father, as we come before you this day, Lord, we come as sinners, but we rejoice in the fact that you are with us, that you forgive us, and that we need you every hour, every minute, every second. And as we come this day, we lay aside all things worshiping you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So join us now as we gather in your place. For it's in the name of Christ we do pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you now to open your hymnals as we stand and sing hymn 243, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Our scripture lesson today is taken from the Old Testament, from Leviticus, chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, and continuing through chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Read with me now. The Lord summoned Moses and spoke to him from the tent of the meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when any of you bring an offering of livestock to the Lord, you shall bring your offering from the herd or from the flock. 
If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you shall offer a male without blemish. You shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of the meeting for acceptance in your behalf before the Lord. When anyone presents a grain offering to the Lord, the offering shall be of choice flour. The worshiper shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it and bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest. After taking it from a handful of the choice flour and oil with all of its frankincense, the priest shall turn this token portion into smoke on the altar an offering by the fire, a pleasing odor to the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Have the children come down front. We'll have a little children's sermon. I'll stand right here so you guys can see me. In just a little bit, we're going to have a sermon, and it's going to come from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And in that letter that Paul wrote to his friends in Rome, the second verse reads like this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So I got to thinking about don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. What would be, say you have a, a new kid that comes to school. They just move into town. They've moved into town. They're in your classroom. What would be, and they look a little different maybe, talk a little different. And what would be like, the normal thing that a lot of kids might do, the behaviors and customs of the world. Yes, Avery. They, they might think they're weird, okay. Would they maybe make fun of them? Okay. Maybe they wouldn't sit with them at lunch. Maybe they would ignore them. They, they, or they just maybe not be very nice to them. So that would be like the common custom of the world and behavior. So God says that he wants us to not be that way. Don't copy that. But what he wants us to do is he wants us to let him transform the way we think, how we think about them, and to uh, do differently because he's transformed us. So what would that look like if we transform the way we think about somebody new like that? And don't copy what all the folks in school might be doing. What might that look like? Okay. Would it maybe, maybe you would be friends with them instead of uh, ignoring them? Maybe you'd be nice to them. Maybe sit with them at lunch or, or talk to them, uh, you know, in between class or something. It would be different than what the normal kind of way we would act with somebody that we don't know. So that's what the Apostle Paul's talking about. He says, don't copy the way everybody always acts. Instead, let God transform us, be different, and act the way he wants us to act by changing our mind. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, help us to always love you and to be nice to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Okie dokie. I invite you now to stand as we sing, Breathe on Me, Breath of God, hymn 235. Thank you. 
As we have the, our time of prayer, I'm reminding of, of a verse that's found in 1 Peter. And it goes like this. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. So as we pray today, you cast your cares on God because he cares for you. He's interested in you. And not only does he care for you, he has the power to make a difference in your life today and in those problems and concerns that are on your heart. Let's pray. Dear God, we have gathered here this morning. We got up. We come to your house, we have met with our friends and, and we've been singing praises to you, we've heard your scripture read out loud, and we've come now to pause for a time of prayer. We've been reminded that we are to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. So I pray right now, Lord, that you would move up and down every pew in this room. And every person that's come out today, that you would, would touch them. May they hear your voice. May they feel your spirit. And as they lay their prayers before you, as they lay their concerns and the burdens that they have brought into this place, to, to, uh, upon you, we ask that you would take them and that you would work in them in a special way to bring about your will so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And we thank you, Lord, that you care for us and that you have the power to make a difference in our lives. So it's in the name of Jesus, the name which at every knee shall bow, and the name above all other names. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's take a moment for a, a word of prayer before we take a look at these verses from Romans chapter 12. Dear God, we ask now that as we come to hear your word, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to hear it. I ask, Lord, that you would help us to believe it. I ask, Lord, that you would help us to live it. And may we put it into practice in our life. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul goes into quite a bit of detail about our need for God and how we can get right with God and what God has done for us and through Jesus Christ. And then we come to chapter 12 and Paul takes a pivot, a turn. And going from talking about all this doctrines about how to be right with God and, and what God has done for us through Christ, he now swifts, switches the focus onto some practical advice. And so in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, from the New Living Translation, he, hear these words. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. A living sacrifice to God. Well, when I look at these verses, the first thing I notice is if we're going to really worship God with a sacrifice, an offering to God, a living sacrifice, a living offering to God, the first thing that just comes right out to us from Paul is that we are to give our body to God. Now, some of us have pretty good bodies. Some of us are fit. I'm probably not in that category. But that's not what God's talking about. He's not saying, give me all the, the Hall of Fame athletes. No, give me all the smart people, the strong people, the young people, the good-looking people. No, he's not talking about making an offering of the body like that. When he says to give all our bodies to him, to give our body to God, what he's talking about is very simply, it's the dedication of the whole life of a person to God. God is interested in us giving our whole life to him. That's the essence of giving our bodies to God, it's the, it's the complete, total surrender of our life to God. Well, you say, well, why should we do that? I kind of like the way things are going. I like what I'm doing. I like the things that are happening. Why should I give my whole self to him completely and total surrender to God? Well, Paul tells us why. He goes on to say, because of all he has done for you. Out of a heart of gratitude because of what God has done for us. Well, then that got me thinking. Okay, if I need to give myself completely and totally to God, and the reason I need to do that is because he has done all he has done for me, then I need to know what has he done for me. Well, Paul tells us that too. In Romans chapter 5, back in the first part of the book, in verse 8, Paul puts it like this. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. So what has God done for us? Very simply, he's done three things. He showed us his great love for us. You've never, ever 
experience love in all its fullness, in all its richness, until you've experienced the great love that God has shown us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So how did he show us that great love? Well, he sent Christ to die for us. Christ was the ultimate sacrifice for us. He was the ultimate offering on an altar. Brad read for us this, uh, in, in the book of Leviticus uh, about the, the characteristics of if you brought an animal, what kind, and it had to be without blemish and male, and, and, then, and then the grain offering, if you, if you gave a grain offering to God, it had to be the best, the finest. Not the stuff in your refrigerator that's past the expiration date. Not the leftovers from a couple of weeks ago. No, God wants the best. He wants the best. And that's exactly what God gave to us. Christ died for us. He died as a sacrifice for us as a, uh, on the altar. Not an altar that was built with stone and, and had wood and a fire. No, his altar was a wooden altar but it was in the shape of a cross. He died for us. But it even gets better than that. Not only did Christ, did God love us so much that he sent Christ to die for us, he said in Romans 5, 8, he died for us while we were still sinners. I don't know about you, but I fall in that category quite frequently. And isn't that wonderful to know that God doesn't wait for us to get our act together. He's not waiting for us to kick all our bad habits. God died for us while we were still sinners. When was that? When did God die for us? When we needed it the most. Because sin is what separates us from God. And so that's what God has done for us. He loved us so much that Christ died for us. And when did he die for us? When we needed it the most, while we were still sinners. Well, that is a living and holy sacrifice, is what Paul says we're to be. When we totally surrender our life to God, I give our bodies to God in that total, complete surrender, then that is a living and a holy sacrifice. God's not interested in us to go home tonight and uh, kill the, the dog or our neighbor's cat that you don't like. No, God is not interested in animal sacrifice. He's interested in the living sacrifices of us laying aside our desires for his desire, of us putting all our energy and resources at his disposal so that he can guide us. And he says, this is, this is the kind that he will find acceptable, well-pleasing to God. This is truly the way to worship him, Paul said in the, in the remainder of that first verse. If you really want to worship God, you got to totally surrender and give yourself completely to God. One of my favorite preachers, you've heard me mention it before, his name is Tony Evans, preacher out of Texas. And he has a way with words. And in talking about this idea of a living sacrifice, a holy sacrifice and a, a, that's pleasing to God, that, that's complete, total surrender, he says it's kind of like the difference between what a chicken and a pig bring to a bacon and eggs breakfast. A chicken brings a contribution. He brings some eggs and goes home. The pig brings a sacrifice. The pig must be slain and die in order to have the bacon. That's the kind of worship that God is looking for. He's not looking for Christians that are going to come and, and, and give him an egg here or give him an egg there. No, he wants Christians that will give 
totally their life to him, that will give complete to him, that will give the bacon. That's what he's looking for. Well, this idea of complete dedication to God and total surrender is not a new concept in the Bible. It's not new starting in Romans chapter 12. We find this whole idea all the way back in the Old Testament. And it's the whole concept of you got to put first things first. If you want to have a living sacrifice with God, things have to be in order, in sequence. And first things first. And the very... And that, in simple terms, is God has to be first. Pop quiz. Don't everybody answer at once. In Exodus chapter 20, I'll even give you, if you're fast and look it up on your phone or in the Pew Bible, I'll even give you the, the chapter 20, verses 3 through 6. But the question is, on the idea of first things first, what is the first commandment? that God gave Moses. Do what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart? Exactly. He said, he said, you must have no other gods before me. He wants to be first. He's not interested in being second or fifth or sixth or eighth. He wants to be first. First commandment. You must have no other gods but me. And then he goes on in verse 5 and he says, I, the Lord your God, I'm a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. First things first. God's got to be first. And then, to John, to your point, when Jesus was asked, what's the most important commandment? They were trying to trick him. And Jesus said, it's very simple. He said, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. That's the first. First things first. No other God but him. Love God with everything. The greatest commandment. And then Jesus kind of said it this way on his Sermon on the Mountain. In Matthew 6, he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So this morning, if we're going to have a living sacrifice, then we need to seek first the kingdom of God. God needs to be first place in our life. It needs to be total surrender and dedication to God. We need to be the bacon, not the eggs. Well, the, Paul also goes on to say, if you really want to truly worship God, you give your body to God, total surrender. And then number two, he says, you need to give your mind to God. I can hear, I, I can read your mind, by the way. And I can hear what you're saying. You don't want my mind. My mind's not as sharp as it used to be. <laughs> I don't even remember what I said a few minutes ago, much less anything else. No, he's not talking about it in that regards. He's talking about it when he said in that second verse that I read with the, with the kids that came down front, he said, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Did you catch that? Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So he doesn't want us to conform. Most translations say don't conform to this world. We're not to copy the behaviors and customs of this world because you see, the behaviors and customs of the world, they are opposite of to what God is looking for in us. That word conform, it's the idea of to fashion, to shape, to mold into something. And we're not to allow the world to squeeze us into its mold. Apostle Paul, in his letter to Galatians, he, he kind of calls it out pretty simply in talking about the, the sinful nature and, and the spirit. Here's the way of the world. Listen if you have seen any of this on the news lately or, or know of things like this going on. 
When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties. And then if, if that didn't get anybody, step on anybody's toes, he has an all other category. Uh, and this is how he words it. And other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I had before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the way of the world. That's the way opposite of God. That's going away from God, not towards God. So what's the contrast? What's the way of God? Well, in verse 22 of Galatians 5, he says very simply this. After saying all that stuff about sexual immorality and anger and selfish ambition and so forth, he goes on and says, but there's another way to live, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, and listen to what he says at the end of verse 25. Since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Two ways to live. And it's controlled by our mind. You know, every action that we commit, it didn't just happen. Every action is preceded by what? by thought. So what we try to do, at least me, and I'm assuming some of you are like me, what I try to do is, okay, I want to just change my action. I want to change doing this or doing that. And sometimes I'm successful. Many times I'm not. But if we, I will do, and if you will do what Paul says, and he, he said, let God, did you catch that? Let God transform you. So you want different actions. You've got to be transformed. Transform you into a new person. There's all the new actions. And how does he do it? By changing the way you think. If you want to change a habit, change the way you think. If you want to change an action, change the way you think. Well, then that gets me to thinking, how should I think? Well, we need to think things that God thinks. We need to be on the same page with our thoughts that God is. And, we, and, and Paul explains it in Romans 8 this way. He says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature, thinking all about those, all those bad things, control your mind leads to death. But let the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. I don't know about you, but I like, I like peace. I could use some peace. You need peace in your life? Let God transform the way you think. Prophet Isaiah put it this way. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Let God transform the way you think. And when you let God transform the way you think, then you will have different actions and you will walk in a different way. But there's one more thing that Paul calls us out to do. Not only are we to give our body total surrender, complete dedication to God, not only are we to give our mind to God, 
because our, our thoughts are what determine our actions. And not only are we to give our mind to God, to be on the same page with God in what we think, we are to give our will to God. So Paul says it like this. He said, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. It's all about God's will. You know, the problem is, for a lot of us, it's all about my will. <laughs> it's my will be done. It's my will. God, I need you to get onto my agenda. God, you need to get in my calendar. You need to get a place in my life. You need to, to get on board with what I'm doing. No, no, that's kind of backwards. God is saying to us today, he says, no. He says, no, you need to be on my agenda, his will, his his way, his plans for our life. That's what God wants. Well, you say, Dennis, well, how do you know what his will is? How do you know what his plans are for your life? Well, you let him transform the way you think. And the only way you can let him do that, the best way to let him do that is from the Bible, God's word. He's already given us quite a bit of information about himself. 66 books from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. He's revealed himself. He's revealed what his will looks like. He's revealed what he's looking for, what he expects. That is how you know God's will. David, a man after God's own heart, said in Psalms 119, 11, he said, I've hidden your word in my heart. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know, ignorance is not a, a pass to, um, uh, to get out of something you do wrong. If, if you make a mistake on your taxes, I do my own taxes. I use a, uh, a tax program on the computer. I've done it for years and years and years. And I try to be as accurate and honest and truthful and forthright as I can be. But if, let's say, I didn't use it one year and I just filled it out by hand and, and I did my taxes, I sent it in, and then several weeks later or a month later or whenever it would be, all of a sudden I get something in the mail that says, you got to bring all your records down to the uh, IRS, we're going to review it. We're going to audit you. Well, you got to do it. So you bring all your stuff down there, and they go through it, and they go through this and this. And say, oh, it's looking pretty good. And then also, oops, Mr. Griffin, you claim this deduction. That deduction is not really a deduction. Therefore, your income is more than what you said it was. So now you're going to need to pay us some money. And not only that, we're going to charge you a penalty for getting it wrong. And you say, well, but sir, I didn't know. How was I to know I couldn't deduct that? He goes, he says, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. You were wrong. You made a mistake. Doesn't matter if it's an honest mistake or dishonest mistake. A mistake is a mistake. And that's the way it is with God. The way we know his will is by looking at the scripture because that's where he's revealed it to us. That's where we know what is pleasing to him and what he wants for us and what he has for us. In fact, Psalms 119.105 says, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. I got my phone with me here. Don't worry, I got the clock on, and I turned the screen so it won't go black. So far, it's staying on the clock. Usually, I accidentally bump into it, and it ends up with something weird on it, and I can't see the clock. 
But so far, we're in good shape. I can see the clock. But if I touch it, and I don't want to touch it because I don't want to mess up the clock, there's a little thing here in the back that's a light. And that little rascal is bright. And if you're outside in the dark and you need to see something and you need a light and you don't have a flashlight and you got a, an Apple iPhone on your hand, I'm not sure about an Android, but on an Apple phone, you can push a little button and you're going to have light. And what's that light going to do? It's going to illuminate what you're trying to look at so you can see, so you don't stumble over something because you didn't see it. That's what the light does. It's a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Well, what is God's will? Is, is it, a, is it a, a good thing? Well, Apostle Paul's finished up by saying that you'll know the will of God for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Good. Pleasing. Perfect. Or perfect has the connotation of complete. Complete. We want to be and need to be in the will of God. When you read about prayer in the Bible, what does it say? If you will ask according to his what? Somebody say it. Will. What does he do? He hears us. And when he hears us, what does he do? He answers us. So you need to know God's will so you can pray to God. And, and, and that's, he wants our will. Well, the greatest example of this whole idea of the will, it, it, it actually happened on a Thursday night. Uh, over 2,000 years ago. Jesus and his disciples they had been in the upper room and they, they had a, uh, a the, celebrated the Passover. He made it the first communion, the first Lord's Supper. He gave the Passover a new meaning. And they had celebrated the Passover together and he told them that um, things were going to get pretty rough here very quickly. And, and I'm going to die, Jesus told them. So they left the Passover and he took them up onto the Mount of Olives. And he, they stopped and he took a few of them with him and he went a little bit further. He left them and then he went a little bit further. And then Jesus says he walked away about a stone's throw and he knelt down and he prayed. And this is what he prayed. You, you know it, you've heard it before. Father, If you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. And here's the word. Yet, I want your will to be done, not. And the Bible says in Luke 22, verse 43, then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. I don't know how many times I've read that account. And I have read over verse 43, lickety split, to get to the rest of the story of, of being falsely accused and standing before Pilate and being whipped and having a crown of thorns placed on his head, and then being carrying a, a heavy wooden cross through the streets of Jerusalem to a hill known as Golgotha, Mount Calvary. And being placed on that cross. And when that Roman soldier nailed his right hand to the cross, Jesus said to himself, not my will. Your will be done. Then he nailed his left hand to the cross and Jesus said to himself, not my will, 
I don't want to die. But your will, God, Father God, your will be done. And then when the spear went in his side, Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. And then the last words that Jesus uttered as recorded into the Gospels. Jesus said, it is finished. He gave up the spirit. He died. Why? Why did he die? For you and for me? Because why? Because we're sinners. And he's the only perfect sacrifice that can pay the price, the debt for our sin was Christ, God himself, God the Son, dying on a cross, giving up his human will to be doing God's will for us. You've probably sang this hymn hundreds of times. I know I've sang it hundreds of times. It goes like this, and it kind of sums up everything I've been trying to say this morning. It says, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence, daily live. The chorus goes like this. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. That is a living and holy sacrifice pleasing to God. Amen. As Sue plays a little bit for us, let's have a time of reflection. And you just pray a simple prayer. And you say, Dear God, show me where I need to surrender my life Transform my thinking. Show me what I need to give to you and turn over to you. And you just surrender everything to God. This morning, you can do it right in your pew as Sue plays for us. Let's stand and take our hymnals and we'll sing number 503. Lord, speak to me that I may speak.
Let us pray. Dear God and Father, who have seen it fit that we arrive here this morning between these consecrated walls to render our sacrifice and offerings unto you. Thank you for the blessing that you have showered upon us. And may these gifts that are given be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom and to multiply it that may meet the needs of those that are hurting. Give us grace and give us peace. Amen. You may be seated. Just a few common concerns. You'll see them in your worship guide. Let me just call to your attention. Uh, you'll want to make notes. Sunday, November 7th, we'll be having some uh, CBF, Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, uh, personnel who work, live and work in North Carolina. They'll be coming and sharing with us about the, their ministry there, and you'll want to be here to hear how God is working through them. A game night coming up in November, on November the 18th, and you'll see the details on that. Uh, then you also want to note um, that's in the announcements. Uh, there's a, this coming week, uh, Thursday, is a community trick or treat, and we're going to have a table there. You know, kids, uh, you can see Michael Williams there and John Hensley for help and questions on that. Next week is the annual semi annual business meeting, uh, it'll be at 10 o'clock, and of course, you want to be participating in that. All Saints Day will also be next Sunday, as we remember those who have died this past year, a very uh, important and meaningful uh, worship service. And we have elections going on during, uh, coming up, and there's in your bulletin, you've got um, opportunities to nominate people for ministry council and leadership council and deacon, and you'll want to be sure and read the, the information there and take advantage of that. And... Um, and the thermal shelter is our mission moment for this month, and you'll want to be sure to make a special offering for that. Let's stand. Let's pray. Dear God, as we leave this place, we pray that you would go before us and show us the way. We pray that you would go behind us and watch over us and protect us. We pray, dear God, that you'd go beside us and hold us and carry us and take care of us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.